Hello and welcome to Old Ways Gardening and Prepping. My name is Teresa. I'd like to welcome you each on another adventure with me. Tonight is the monthly um, August meeting for the Herb Society of Memphis. So tonight we're going to have a really good guest speaker. Uh, he's retiring from service at the uh, Memphis Botanic Garden, and he's going to give a speech about his lifetime work. I look forward to this uh, talk, and I hope you enjoy it as well. So let's get in here and get to this meeting. I'll see y'all here in a bit. Heading up to the Memphis Botanic building, main building. I don't know what's going on here tonight, but oh lordy, I had to park all the way to in the back 40 just about. So walk we will. Beautiful lantanas, banana plants. Gingers. <laughs> oh, that's pretty. It has beautiful purple flowers. Velvet leaf colancho. Oh, that's pretty. That's real pretty. Celosia. No, that's coleus. I'm wrong. Beautiful oxalis, also known as shamrocks. All right, let's head inside. Okay, got to go all the way down to Sarah's place. More walking. Oh, that's a pretty acrylic on canvas. That's beautiful. Oh, it's something to do about rich people in Memphis and May. You got a alcohol bar set up. Nothing I'm interested in. Oh, the beautiful fountain. I've got to finally get time to volunteer and bring you all around to see the Alice in Wonders exhibit. Man, I'm going to enjoy getting to sit down once I get to the meeting area. See, here's part of the Alice in Wonderland exhibit, the chess set. Okay. Hey, how you doing, Eli? Oh, Lord of mine. What you got? Uh, I don't know what it is. My mom asked me to bring in and ask. It's very, it's a fuzzy plant. Oh, I know. What? I've been all around it. I can't remember the name of it. We? Pretty much. Oh, y'all look. Berries on the salmon seal. And this is native wild salmon seal. We're going to finally make it eventually. 
As long as my get up and go don't give out. But more beauty of the botanic garden. I know I want him to come, but whew. Beautiful Linton roses. Mass planting of Linton roses. Beautiful ferns. And there's, I don't know if you can see it, there you go. That's the boxwood hedge that encircles the herb garden. Whew. Sweat rolling down in my eyes. We're almost there, thank gracious. Beautiful hydrangeas. Beautiful. Oh, and we have uh, azalea blooming. Had to stop and think there for a minute. Sorry, got to talking. She said if she'd seen me, she'd gave me a ride. Whew. It'd been nice, but I still wouldn't have been able to show y'all. Now, here's a beautiful Mahonia. It doesn't have any berries on it, but it did bloom. You can see the bloom stalks. Alright, let's head in. Whew. I'm Anita Longs. I'm the Vice President of the Herb Society. I was President. Uh, Ginger Wynn is in the process of moving, um, and so she could be with us tonight. Uh, send her some happy thoughts and, and prayers, because I think we all know how disruptive moving can be. All right, um, before I jump into the business portion of our program, which I will tell you is very short, let's give Madison a few minutes. Hi. Good evening, Thanks. everybody. I'm President of Wild Ones as of a week ago. Uh, I started the organization, Native Plants, One Landscape at a Time, a year ago with the dream of having native plants in everyone's yard. Uh, lands, um, native Plant Landscape of Wild Ones has been a part of the United States since 1977. I brought it to the Mid-South. Okay? We have Mississippi, Tennessee, and Arkansas. We now have 60 members. We have $5,900 in the bank after our first two plant sales. And all of it is to drive native plant education. We want to bring that home and bring that home strong. We have three states, 82 counties, and we are going at a kilt and opening up next year, 2023. I am resigning as of a week ago. We have new members, new faces, and a new slate. I want to introduce our new president this evening. Her name's Jill Mabry, her very own botanic oh, garden. Yeah. Say hello to Jill. Our vice president will be Ann Valentine. Uh, our secretary is Susan McKeel. And also we have Marcel Sanders as our uh, membership chair, I will step down to treasurer. Okay, we are very proud to have this new slate. We have new programs, and we are so excited about what's going to be going on in the Mid South for this coming year and the future for Native plants. As you all know, we will be pushing it through children, adults, high schools, and garden center education. Okay, welcome, Jim. And that's all I have. I wasn't planning to say anything. Oh, no. I kind of dropped in tonight so that I wanted to hear, hear Rick and wasn't expecting to be to be introduced. But, um, but yes, thank you. I'm excited about uh, working with Wild Ones. We're going to have a, a fun um, slate of programs for this coming year. Uh, we're going to go on some hikes and visit, visit some wild places and talk about incorporating natives into your gardening routine. Uh, so it's going to be going to be a lot of fun. I'd like to 
start out by thanking our commercial sponsors, Bay of Cares, Davies Plantation, and also Jones Orchard. Um, if you haven't been up to Jones Orchard to get some peaches, uh, the peaches are still going strong, and so I encourage you to head up there and, um, and pick up a couple of baskets. Or if you want to, they also do pick your own, but um, if you're like me and you're short on time, they have wonderful <coughs> baskets ready to go. Um, thank you everyone who brought food tonight. Um, there's still quite a few uh, snacks over there, so feel free to help yourself and enjoy. Uh, usually Jennifer will include recipes in the newsletter, so if you brought something tonight and would like to share your recipe, uh, please send it to Jennifer to her email address. The Treasurer's Report is um, in the newsletter that went out, as well as the minutes. Actually, the newsletter was kind of short this morning. So actually, you may see uh, doubled up Treasurer's Report and minutes in the next newsletter. Uh, we do have some upcoming events that you're going to want to mark on your calendar. Of course, we'll have our regular monthly meeting on the fourth Thursday in September. Um, let's see, we are going to have two of our own speaking at that meeting about uh, tea and lemon balm, and it should be a lot of fun, very hands-on, um, with taste testing, and it's going to be, um, it's going to be great fun. Um, and that's Evelyn Mosley and um, Jennifer Stanick that are going to present. Then in, we have a meeting in October, again, our regular monthly meeting. And then we have a special meeting in November, we'll be in Harden Hall. Uh, so we have plenty of room because that's the night of our silent auction. Um, and so if you have items that you would like to contribute for the silent auction, um, you can go ahead and shoot an email to Ginger Wynn. Um, what we're probably going to do is circulate some pictures of items in advance of the auction and actually just take the items for sale that night. Um, and if you want to help with the auction, oh my goodness, we can use lots of help with the auction, either that night, helping set up, uh, helping um, receive and tag the items that are going to be for sale, as well as, of course, cleanup and all of that. So if you're interested in that, you know, come find, oh, we do have a sign-up sheet. Yay, yay, we have sign-up sheets for that. So if you're interested, uh, and the date of that is going to be November 16th. So it's not the fourth Thursday of the month because that will be Thanksgiving. Uh, November 16th, mark it on your calendar, plan to attend. It's always a lot of fun. And again, if you'd like to help, we have sign-up sheets in the back. Um, we are in the process of planning for the 2023 programs. We have a number of uh, slots filled already, but there are some open slots. So if you have an idea for a speaker, um, please feel free to you can come and find me, you can come and find Kathy James. Um, and give us that information, and we'll have the program committee follow up on that with the, uh, with the, the, the proposed speaker. We also need volunteers, as always, for uh, hospitality, for helping us set up the food, and cleaning up audiovisual. We can always use help in that area. So again, if those are things that you would like to help out with, participate with, sign up sheets in the back. All right, let's see. Ginger did a lovely agenda here for me to follow so that we, are, so that we don't get lost. Um, uh, I do want to share a, a sad note with everyone here tonight. Um, many of you may have seen the obituary for Sarah Burnett um, that appeared last week. Sarah was um, a longtime member of the Herb Society. I think she was very instrumental in getting things started, and she was, in fact, the president for the second year of the Herb Society's existence, and um, uh, you know, was a regular attender and participant, and um, loved the botanic garden, loved gardening, loved herbs, loved sharing her knowledge with people who um, were interested. She was a wonderful teacher, and she put together uh, this booklet, A Year in the Herb Garden, which for many years uh, was uh, printed by the Herb Society and available at our meetings. It's been a while, but Sarah went through and uh, made a list of items for every month that uh, a gardener might want to keep track of and use in planning for 
keeping the garden that exists going and then planning for the next year's garden. Um, so uh, just wonderful, wonderful person and she will be here. <coughs> All right, Kathy, would you like to introduce our speaker? Um, is there any other business before we move on to our speaker? sitting next to Sarah during my first years in the Herb Society, and she would always be telling me little snippets of things, so she, you're right, she will, she'll be very much more. It is, good evening everybody, it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Rick Pudwell. I won't say he needs no introduction because when I said that last month, Two people told me afterwards they were new to Memphis and they did not know Rick so well. Well, they do now. Rick is well known in the Memphis and Shelby County plant world, and it is no surprise that people were coming here for his presentation. People here from the Memphis Works uh, Society are among the audience, and also some master gardeners and members of various gardening clubs. All of these groups have bestowed honors upon Rick Pudwell. It is no surprise that, well, you know, we're here at the Memphis Botanic Garden for this kind of celebration because this is where he has worked for many, many years and the Hort Building, as we all know, has been named in his honor. So yes, during his 36 years in Memphis, he's been recognized for his service to the hort horticultural community. Tonight, he will talk about the various places he has worked, especially his 27 years at the Memphis Botanic Garden. And I expect he will give us some insights into what it was like for this guy from Chicago to become immersed in the horticulture of Zone 7B. <laughs>
married a dairy farmer in Wisconsin, and I thought that was heaven. I was five years old, never been around a cow, and we would spend a lot of time in southern Wisconsin where he was, and that grandmother, by, who was Grandma Pudwell, she had been Grandma, she became Grandma Schwartz, and she married him, uh, was quite a garden, and she grew everything. She, had, she grew vegetables and herbs and flowers of all kinds, and everything was fertilized with cow manure, because that's what they had. But she refused to live on the farm, so they lived in a house on Lake Dullivan, which was kind of neat, because when we were there, of course, we'd go swimming and fishing and all that. I learned how to ice fish from that grandfather, and I hated it, because we would go out in the winter, and it wasn't like today, where they have these little heated huts and everything. You have a little shack, and my job, they'd clogger a hole in the ice with a hand order, and my job was to scoop the ice out of the hole so that you know the, it wouldn't freeze up. And then you'd catch perch, you'd catch walleye pike, and they'd lay on the ice until you were ready to go home. You had to scrape them off because they were frozen like a board, and then you take them home and thaw them. To this day, I hate eating fish. <laughs> I've seen so many fish when I was a kid. So anyway, so that, that was kind of my background growing up. And my parents, because I liked to garden and I loved animals, and I was always bringing things home, um, by an animal boat discouraged me because they said that's something greenhorns do. That's what immigrants do. That you know you shouldn't you shouldn't grow. Well, that didn't stop me. Of course, that's what I wanted to do. And then I had an aunt. She's actually a cousin of my mother's. We called her an aunt, and she was quite a gardener. She grew roses and she grew delphiniums and she grew just beautiful flowers. But back in the fifties, if you remember, we thought chemicals at that time were the best things since sliced bread. And she would dust everything with with. Chemical dust. She died of cancer when she was 50. But she also had a pet shop and she raised boxer dogs and parakeets and canaries, and that I learned a lot from her and hamsters and tropical fish. And I had all that stuff at home. So by the time I was in fifth grade, I was a little entrepreneurial and I was selling parakeets for 10 bucks and I thought I was a rich kid. You know? But so I've, I've had the bug for living things my entire life. And, and so I've, I've all, always enjoyed that. Um, when I went to Michigan State, I majored in commercial flower production and greenhouse management. And things then were totally different than they are today. Before I went to college, I worked for a local greenhouse in Moments, Illinois. We had moved from Chicago to the suburbs to Lombard and eventually down toward Kankakee, which is about 50 miles south of Chicago. a little family greenhouse in moments where I worked in the summertime and they grew they had like four greenhouses that were 150 feet long probably a little wider than this room they were big glass houses and they grew cut flowers they grew vegetables they grew bedding plants and then seasonal pot plants like lilies and poinsettias and moms and azaleas and all that and so in the summertime we would do all that but you know how potting soil comes in a bag that's not how it came back then they would dig soil from along the Kankakee River, which was kind of silty soil. We'd get in bales of peat moss, and then we'd get in sand, and we'd mix it together. We had a little Swiss rototiller that had tines that were rounded, and we'd put it in these raised beds in the greenhouse, and we would till it together. But at the time, I didn't realize that the base of those beds was corrugated asbestos, but we'd grow till then. <laughs> and then we then, we had a steam boiler that was run with coal, and we would run a steam hose onto those beds, cover them with canvas, heat the soil to 180 degrees with a meat thermometer, and in the summer, that's what I spent my time in those greenhouses, we steam sterilized every one of the benches. It's a wonder I stayed in this, isn't it? And at that time, everything was clay pots or metal containers, they didn't have plastic yet, and so, the, the aisles were narrow because they wanted to get as much in the greenhouses as they could. We had wooden flats. There was one old retired man, probably as old as I am now, that made the wooden flats, and then we'd fill them with clay pots, you know, and then we had like a one bicycle wheel cart that you push down the aisles, and heaven forbid that you drop the thing because you had, you know, they did, they, everything was clay pots and it was great. And they grew thousands of geraniums for the Chicago market in little pots, as well as carnations and cow lilies roses and you know all kinds of stuff. So I, I learned a lot when I was in high school uh, all those summers. But when I went to college, that's when they were starting to do uh, all these mixes with bark and so forth. So that was like you know a big revelation to me because I thought everything was in soil. 
And at that time, they, at Michigan State, that's a huge university. The campus is like 3,000 acres, and they had plant science greenhouses, they had agriculture greenhouses, and they had forest greenhouses. And then they had all kinds of farm stuff, too. And in the greenhouses, depending on where you were going, you know, it might be a greenhouse where they were growing pumpkins and watermelon, it might be one where they were growing Gerber daisies. You know how you're used to Gerber daisies and bedding plants now? At that time, they were this tall. They only came in mixed colors. They were only used for cut flowers. And there was, there was a man there from Czechoslovakia, and he, he was doing a doctorate on Gerber daisies. He was trying to sort the colors so they had single colored strains. This is in the 60s. And then also make them dwarfer so they could be pot plants. And obviously, he succeeded. Or somebody did. I don't know if it was him. But that, that was something really interesting. So anyway, I, I learned a lot while I was there. And then shortly after I got out of college, the Vietnam War hit, and so I was drafted. And so when I went into the Army they, that day, this was 68, they um, were drafting Marines. And I was like one away from being a Marine. Thank goodness I didn't make it, but you, 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 you're Army, you're a Marine. You, you, you're Army, you're a Marine. <laughs> and so I ended up at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. And um, they give you this battery of tests. And so I wondered, because a lot of guys were just failing on purpose. And I, so I asked one of the sergeants, I said, what's happening to these people that don't uh, pass the test? Oh, they're going in the infantry. I'm not going to pass the test. <laughs> what happens if you pass all the tests? Well, you've got a choice of going to the medical corps or flight training if your vision's 2020. Well, my vision wasn't 2020, so I was in medical training. So I spent a year and a half in Southeast Asia field hospital and also doing a little bit of things that we don't often talk about, but we would sometimes go into villages doing um, immunizations for women and children because we were we would go like in northern Thailand and Cambodia, I believe in Burma, and there were places where there were hill tribes and the men were actually fighting for us in Vietnam, but the women and children and the old men were in the villages and if the witch doctor would let you in, we would come in and give immunizations to women and children. It was like National Geographic Live. You'd go in some of the huts, there'd be a pig nurse and pigs in one corner and woman nurse and a baby in the other. You know, no English. It was just amazing. It'd be like two of us with a translator and a chief and we always prayed we had enough gas to get back down the mountains. And we did. But that was always kind of scary. Uh, but anyway, I survived all that. And then when I got back, uh, after I got out of service, for a sh very short time, I worked for the same company that I had worked in in high school. And then um, after that, I started working for a company in Chicago and that had multiple greenhouses and, and, and flower shops. And then after a few years, I moved back to close to where my folks lived and I worked for a nursery that was both wholesale and retail. And I became the retail manager and he would grow just lots and lots of shade trees and fruit trees and as well as evergreens and shrubs in the ground. And we would ball and burlap. And so I learned how to ball and burlap. I learned how to graft. We used to graft trees by the hundreds, mostly tea budding, but we did some cleft grafting too. And that was, you know, just really valuable for me to learn all that. And I, I enjoyed that thoroughly. Did that for a number of years. And then a friend of mine that I had worked with those, those years when I was in Chicago had opened a flower shop Banky Key, and then he ended up buying two other ones out, and he wondered if I'd be his greenhouse manager. So I said, sure. And so I was working in the summer for that nursery, and then, of course, up there, nurseries close, like at Thanksgiving time, don't open again until April, and then one for one year, and then I, I'd work for Elmer, the other guy, the head of the flower shops in the winter, and that just didn't work. He couldn't do both. So I, I finally decided I'd be the greenhouse manager for him, but then he realized I could do design. I had to take one design class when I was in college. That was part of the curriculum. And that was good at the time because I could get a job on Saturdays in the flower shop and it was hard to find jobs at that time. So anyway, then they would drag me in the shop whenever they had a big event or a wedding or a funeral or something. So that's how I got into doing design. It wasn't by intent, but it just, it just happened. And so you know, I, I still I think I, I'm doing something for the Orange Mountain cemetery dedication tomorrow, you know, and I cut for Ikebana, and I do stuff for the events here, and the concerts, and things like that, which I enjoy. I'm just glad I don't have to do it every day. But that's been part of my life all that time. 
So anyway, I also, in addition to all that, had a little 30 acre farm in Illinois that I bought. And I bought it for a song at that time. I think it was like $25,000 when I bought it. And it was 30 acres, a house, a 100 foot chicken house, a barn, and you know, all the little outbuildings and everything. And so I kind of burned the candle at both ends and worked and then did that too. And then about four or five years later, I met my wife in choir at the church where I attended. And um, she was the organist. She's still the organist in the church where we are now. <coughs> and, um, we got married a year or so later. And um, about three years later, we had our first child, and a couple years later, the other one. And um, we had the farm, and she was teaching school, and I was working at the greenhouses and uh, also work in the farm best I could. And we had two winters in a row that were just awful in the early 80s. The one winter, it got down to 30 below zero for three or four days. And we couldn't get the house above 50. And the septic tank froze, the water lines froze. You had to take the batteries out of the vehicles that night and bring them to the house. And I said to Chris, my wife, I said, you know, there's gotta be a better place to live than this. This is really terrible. <laughs> she agreed. So, we started sending out resumes, and I got I had three job offers, and one was a place in Michigan called Applewood, which is a botanic garden. Interestingly enough, years later, George Wise, who used to be the director here, ended up there. <laughs> the other one was Dylan Ripley, who was secretary of the Smithsonian at the time, and he wanted me to manage his personal estate in Litchfield, Connecticut. And he also had a huge collection of waterfowl, which was really exciting and it, it's now a, in a foundation and uh, it still exists even though he's passed away but I found out Litchfield Connecticut is like a summer home for a lot of the Hollywood stars and stuff and we would have been like subhumans trying to raise kids there so I decided that was not a good choice and then the zoo I came for an interview here in February and one of the things I remember when I came for the interview at the zoo was it was one of those really nice, nice days in February, you know, when it's like 70 degrees. And we came here and walked around, and I remember the magnolias were in bloom. And I thought, geez, this is a great place, and it's so green, and you know, in the wintertime. And on the way back to Illinois, it snowed like you wouldn't believe, and I thought, no, this is really a great place. <laughs> so, anyway, a couple weeks later, I get a call from the city, and I had said there was a, a range of salaries. And little did I know, they kind of suckered me in, but they, they gave me the highest possible for that job, which was more than I was making, so it was very <coughs> So I moved down here probably about six weeks later, like in April, and uh, my wife and kids stayed up there until July, because she had to finish out the school year and all that with the, with the children. One was already in school, and the other was just two at the time. So we moved here, and I had been renting an apartment, but because the family was coming, I had to get a house. So, but we hadn't sold our place up there. And so I found, went through ads, you know, at that time they had real newspapers yet. This was 86. And um, found a house in Millington on five acres with a pond that would rent because the guy, it was a log cabin. The guy that owned it couldn't afford the payment, so he was going to move in with his girlfriend in Memphis and he would give me an open ended lease. And I think at the time, if I remember correctly, it was like four fifty a month, which seemed like a steal. And so that's where I moved. And we moved on the fourth of July. And we got here, and my wife cried herself to sleep. She said, "Why did you bring me to this desolate place? This is horrible. I've never been anywhere so hot in my entire life." <laughs> they had a window air conditioner. And then when winter came, the only heat was a wood-burning stove, so I had to park myself near the wood-burning stove and stove the, the, the kids were in the loft upstairs, it was okay, and then we bought a kerosene heater to keep the downstairs warm. So that was kind of an adventure too, but we survived it, and then we eventually moved to Memphis the following spring, and you know, things were looking up because we had heat and air conditioning. <laughs> so anyway, but I stayed through all that. So the years at the zoo were interesting. I had never worked with union employees really before, and there was no horticulture department. I was it. Uh, they had a maintenance department, and they did the sweeping, and they did the bathrooms, and they did, you know, the grass cutting and all of that. At that time, the Overton Park greenhouses that you're familiar with would grow annuals for you, but you had to order them, you know, 
like six months ahead of time. And the order they had for the year before was practically nothing. You know, I was kind of horrified by that. There were no greenhouses or anything. So after there, it was about a year, I got in as good as I could with the Zoo Society. And um, we built one greenhouse. Robert Kubler did that for me from uh, Homestead Farms. And I went to Cheekwood a few months after I was there for some type of seminar they had on fundraising for nonprofits. And I met George Wise and Richard Beckwith and a bunch of the ladies, unfortunately a lot of them that are deceased now, some of them not, but like Joanne Bowes and Joe Hester and Linda Ling and that, that whole group. And they started what they call the Wildflower Garden Club for me at the zoo. And so I instantly had a little volunteer base and they recruited other people. And I think within two or three years we started a plant sale. And I remember Felder Rushing came for a speaker at one of the events we had. And, and we had a couple other notable people. And that, that was all really good. And, and I really had a good feeling about that. And so we did a lot of landscaping at the zoo at that time. And that was the old zoo. You remember the rides when you first came in and all that? And uh, the one story I remember last name, but we had a lady that was the, the financial <coughs> officer, her name was Agnes, and I had planted ornamental peppers near the rides, and two little boys had picked some of them and stuck one in each other's eyes, oh. and, and Agnes came flying, you need to take all those hot peppers out, and I said, no, I said, that's a learning experience, if my kids did that, they wouldn't do it again, and I said, take those kids with you. But it was kind of fun. I tried to do appropriate plants for the type of animals that were in the enclosures. And of course, indoors you could do more. And then after a few years, they hired Ace Tory and they did the big master plan and did the Egyptian wall of the entrance and the back. <coughs> and about the time they did Cat Country, we did Dinosaurs Live the first time at the zoo. I don't know if you all remember mm -hmm. that, the big movable dinosaurs. And that was a giant project. And I, I had no idea we were going to get it done. I mean, of course, we had a deadline. I think I worked something like 40 days without a day off, like seven days a week, trying to get that done. And we did all these berms with tropical plants going up to the tents where they were. And I was just worn out. And the director at the time was not a very nice man, I didn't think. And he and I had words. And uh, after Dinosaur's Wife ended, I quit. And uh, I remember not knowing what I was going to do, but I, I knew I, I had my fill of the zoo. And so I, a lot of people called me and, can you do this, can you do that? And so I, I, was, I kept quite busy. And then Plato Tuliatis was doing um, the spring plant sale out here. And at that time, you know, Harden Hall wasn't here. And can you picture the glass greenhouse where the orchids are? That was kind of where the entrance of the garden was. And there were iron gates between there and where Harden Hall is. And we were set up on this side of the greenhouse. And there were three linden trees there. And he said, if you could put in some water gardens and stand and sell the stuff for me for a couple days, I'd appreciate it. So I said, okay. So he gave me some workers, and we built a couple of ponds above ground, you know, with liners and rock and everything to condition them, water release. I saw water plants. That was the era when water gardens were in in Memphis. And, uh, you know, it's everything in gardening goes in waves. You know, there's times when herbs are really hot, there's times when roses are, and it, that was just the water garden time. And so I did that for him, and then I think by the end of that summer, he asked me if I would work for him. And I said, well, yeah, I would. And uh, it was kind of nice. I mean, I worked on commission, and, but I had to do, I would go to somebody's house, talk to them, make a sketch, what, what was going to be planted, then try to sell the job to them. Usually you end up adjusting a little bit. And then, um, you, but you had two or three of these going all the time. You might be going to somebody's house, you might be selling a job, you also might be laying out a job somewhere else. And then you've got a percentage of each one that was sold. So I was to end up working there about six days a week, you know, long, long days, and that, that got to be kind of a drag too. And so about that same time, Steve Cohen, not the senator, but came here as director. And one day he was at the, gar at the at Trees by Tuliatus, and I learned a lot from Plato. He was probably one of the most intelligent garden people I've ever met. I mean, he was just amazing. And I, I really thought he was a good friend. But anyway, so he said, I sh probably shouldn't have done this, Rick, but Steve Cohen asked about you, and, and I really recommended you, but I don't want you to leave. 
And I said, well, we'll see. And so anyway, about six months later, I ended up here. And at that time, I think we had five or six people in the compound and three gardeners. One was Ronnie McCarty, one was Vicki Armstrong, and the other one was me. And Jim Brown was still here. Yeah. And um, Richard Beckwith had left. And I think Steve Cohen lasted through the, the first year we did the Spring Festival of Flowers where we did it, all these berms on what is the great lawn now. And you got to remember, Hart Hall wasn't here, and none of these gardens on this end were here. And there was an organic vegetable garden and then the rose garden on this end. And the daylily and herb were very little. I don't know if you remember, but the herb garden was those two little beds, and then there were two cactus beds right adjacent, with a little sundial in the middle. So anyway, we did all these berms with plants in March, and it was the coldest March, and they all would freeze. And they, we'd go back out to nights every week and buy more plants and plants again. We did four weekends like that. Well, the second spring came, and he wanted to do the same thing again, and we did. And it wasn't quite as cold, but I think one weekend everything froze, and we had to replant. Well, after that second spring plant sale, the spring plant sale was the fourth week of that, he was fired. <laughs> and then we the so garden what, really. What year? What year are we talking right now? That was probably ninety-seven or eight, yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. And so <clears throat> then uh, we went through a series of directors. It seemed like every other year we had a new director, and the garden really fell on bad times. We had one time where he lost forty percent of the staff in one day. You remember that well? Yeah. <laughs> you were here. Uh, I was amazed I was still here. And then uh, eventually we got Jim Duncan, and that was like a godsend because he turned the place around. And within two or three years, we built the children's garden, which was wonderful. <coughs> I think was the turning point when we, we, when we built the children's garden because we started getting a lot of families coming. We started getting more members, and things really went well. And then about the same time, they started live at the garden. In the first couple of years, it was horrible. Um, they had concerts, but it wasn't profitable. It just, and we worked hard trying to do all that. Of course, there was no stage. They put it staged. And um, it was not good. And then eventually they got their act together. And of course, that's our biggest source of revenue. And it's really good now. And it's, it's, a, it's a great thing that, that we do it. But it had a rocky start. And Jim was here, I think, a little over 10 years. And, the time he was here, all these gardens that are out here on, on this end, plus in the back, if, if you'll remember where Hosta is, was kind of no man's land when it first started, and that was all that all evolved with Leckin Pavilion, and, and uh, Bob Leckin funded that. The Hydrangea Society became involved. We did the hydrangeas. Uh, you know, we added the butterfly garden in the back, which is now the pollinator garden, and, and just a lot of things. So. You know, the garden has really come into its own, and, and, and just so much has happened. When I first started here, we had so many plant societies. It seemed like every garden had a plant society, the Iowa Society. There was even an African Violet Society that would be mm. here. And Day Lily Society, and Rose System, two Rose Societies, and all that. And that, I think, has changed. I think the younger people just aren't joiners like they used to be. I, I'm so happy the Herb Society still exists and seems to be going strong. Ranger is still going. Uh, but, you know, Hosta uh, dissolved a year or so ago. Sad. Uh, but I think Master Gardeners has kind of replaced that because it seems like most people that are in the garden community are in Master Gardeners as well as if they're in plant society. And, and that's fine. It, it's just, I think it's just the way it's changed. And I think with the internet, all the young people are not joiners. They, they, they want to do everything from home. So that's just, you know, how it's been. I, I don't know that that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I guess, you know, a wise person has to adapt to change and life is going to change and, and that's that's how it goes. I think Memphis has a very strong gardening community. I'm always amazed how many people show up for things like this, for our plant sales. Our plant sales have been just over the top uh, the last couple of years. Even during COVID, they were good. And, uh, very thankful for that. That's been just an amazing thing. Thanks to many, many volunteers that we have. Uh, probably most of you remember when we used to do the plant sales in the pine grove, and we 
had lots and lots of vendors. Yes. And you know that's changed now. We're we're kind of in control. We have very few vendors, and you know most of the plants are stuff that we produce here in cuttings or liners or whatever. <coughs> and we buy in a little bit of woody plant material, but that's been a, a, an amazing transformation. Last year was the biggest sale we've ever had. Well, that, that's been great. Uh, you know, all the institutions need a huge base of volunteers, and um, it, it worries me because most people are aging out, and, and we don't have a big crop of younger ones coming. Thank you, Eli, for being here. You need to encourage your friends. <laughs> I was I was very uh, into that when I was your age too, but you know, I'm getting so I can't do as much. So, anyways, that's kind of how horticulture has gone here. Uh, I was in a horticulture society. That, well, one thing I didn't mention, when I first came here, the soil was kind of a, a scary thing to me because I was used to a nice black loam in Illinois. <laughs> and if you dug deep enough, there was rock underneath. And you know, we, when we plow the fields on the farm, you, there'd be granite boulders, there'd be limestone rock, and everybody had rock piles, nobody thought anything of it. You never knew what to do with it, you had so much. Uh, here, of course, rock is something you go to Barb Stone or Christy Cut Stone and purchase <laughs> for a lot of money. And uh, that, that surprised me. And then how was I going to get anything to grow in this clay? But the clay is really great soil if you amend it and, and treat it well. Uh, it's not, you know, the loam in Illinois, if you would work it when it was wet, would make these giant clods that would probably take a year before they would break down. You'd actually have to go through a winter where the frost kind of made it break apart. Um, and of course the ground up there would freeze three, four, or five feet deep depending on how cold it was. For here, we hardly get frozen ground at all. And this clay really is good as long as, as you add enough organic matter or make raised beds if it's, it's low. And, and you can grow just about anything here that, that will grow in this zone. So that, that was a big thing. The other thing when I first came here that I did that helped me a, a tremendous amount. I, I joined Tennessee flower growers, I joined Tennessee nurserymen, I joined Nurserymen Association. I, I joined the Horticulture Society. Uh, I tried to be part of as many plant organizations locally as I could and, and regionally so that I would gain as much knowledge as I could so I could understand what I was doing. And um, I think it helped because I, I, you know, so many people can, in, in urban society, I know you focus on a huge group of plants because there's so many different plants that could be categorized as an urban. But I'm always amazed that people that can only focus on day lilies or roses or one group of plants only, because there's just so much out there. And I, I you know, if I, if I look at a plant or animal of any kind, after I think about it for five minutes, I want one, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I couldn't narrow my focus that much to just grow one group of plants. I, I, I like everything that's alive, I think. And, you know, I think, that's a fault or, or a benefit, but it, it's gotten me through this life. And uh, in spite of my parents discouraging me, I've managed to stay married for 45 years and raise two kids, and both are gainfully employed. So I, I think it wasn't <laughs> the worst choice. Uh, my mother's still alive, but she can't remember anything anymore, so I can't tell her that. That's, uh, and she's 97. So um, anyway, that, that's kind of been my life in horticulture. And I hope it wasn't too scattered, but you understand me a little better now. And uh, I'm thankful for everybody here. I'm thankful that the community has accepted me so well being from the outside. And uh, it's been a good life. And it's been a good run. And I'm happy to have been here. And I'm looking forward to redoing my garden. I, I had 14, you know, 11 trees cut in my front yard oh. last week. They're all big blah, blah, blah pines. And I now have sun where I had shade, which is nice because I've never had sun in my front yard. So half of it's still shaded and half of it's sunny. I still have probably 12 or 15 big trees in my front yard. So uh, I'm looking forward to reworking that into a new garden. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be my first project. <laughs> and I'll have many more. So thank you, all. I have a question. Are you going to open up for some garden tours, possibly? Well, maybe in about two or three years after I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten so hurt. Yeah. Um, how, much, how many acres do you live on now? About four and a half. We live in Memphis, but where we live, where, big, big, okay, where I 
live, I'm on Elmore Road off the summer, and there were a bunch of older houses that were moved there when the expressway went through, when it stopped the Mizzou, and so I'm in about a 100-year-old house that was moved there. And I, where I live, I think I've been a pig farm. <laughs> my my dad's uncle was a pig farmer. Okay, I've raised pigs before too, so I know what's involved. Yeah. I don't want to do it again. I've never <laughs> even seen a pig in real life. Are going to the sales that you have been doing? And are we going to have a lot of changes between the two? As far as the plant sales go, I don't know. Um, I I think he wants to keep this, the plant sales going. Uh, I know some of the volunteers are, are ready to retire as well, just because they've been here a long, long time. So I think there'll be some change. Uh, but I, I can't answer that very well. Anyway, but our plant sales have been great in the last couple of years, for sure. Can you go to the next Memphis Forest Cultural Society meeting? Because we're featuring, we're having a young person. September 6th. Oh, the incoming director here? Yes. Oh. Dan, Daniel, for, for your information, Daniel started here on the 2nd of May or so. Oh. And so he's been here now since May. And they kind of let me step back, and, and I've been working like three or four, sometimes five days a week, uh, doing what I need to do. But he's you know kind of taken charge so it's been a nicer transition because i've been here and if he's got a question i can answer it and yet you know he's he's kind of reorganizing as he sees fit so that's how it's going and i should have mentioned that i'm sorry Thank you everyone for coming. Hope to see you next month on uh, the fourth Thursday for uh, our presentation on lemon ball TNT. Um, if you are interested in helping out with the auction, you still have to sign up sheets in the back. So thank you. Uh, be safe driving home tonight. Okay. Starting my pilgrimage back to the car. I hope y'all enjoyed the video. It's not a usual Herb Society meeting, a lecture, but they wanted to do something special, I guess, because he was retiring. Beautiful lighted pathway. Oh, it's a beautiful evening. Oh, just almost got mugged by a lightning bug. Memphis for you. <laughs> Slowly but surely heading back to the car. Here's the pathway into my beloved herb garden to come volunteer at. Oh, it's a beautiful, cool night. Heading home. One more beautiful look at the Fallon. I rarely get to see it at night lit up. I love to hear the beauty of the water. Oh, you can smell the chlorine. It's a beautiful night. Got a long old walk to the car.
another beautiful walkway here. I miss the old, if anybody remembers Memphis, oh, about 40, 45 years or so ago, the Botanic Garden used to be a big glass arboretum. I miss walking into it. One last gaze at the beautiful fountain. Okay, made it back to the car safely. That was a little hoof of a walk, but that's okay. Made it fine and well. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Yes, I know it's not speaking about herbs. I think they wanted to celebrate his retirement and what he's done for the Botanic Garden. Either or, I hope you've enjoyed it. People coming behind me with headlights on like they got run over because there was another really big event here somebody almost backed over me of course you know um, events when it's not at home I disagree with serving alcohol knowing that people will be drinking and driving because any more people don't respect responsibility you don't drink and drive. If you're going to go to an event, have a designated driver. It's better yet, drink at home where you'll be safe. All right, off my soapbox. I hope you've enjoyed this video, learned a little bit about what all he's done in his life. Um, next two months, going to be uh, speakers. Y'all might enjoy the October workshop or Memphis Herb Society meeting. I will hold that secret secret for a little while longer. Everyone take care, stay safe and sound. Uh, keep on stocking those pantries. Stay positive. Don't let these channels paranoia, scare you and get you to doing things you don't need to do nor buy. I look forward to seeing y'all in my next video. Stay positive, y'all. Keep stocking those pantries. Everyone, take care. Stay blessed. Stay positive and know you got this. I look forward to seeing you in my next video. And may you each be blessed. I'm a heading home, everyone. Take care.